Welcome everyone. I'm Jeremy Druin, manager of the library's Missouri Valley Special Collections. Thank you for joining us for another online installment of our Signature Sunday series. I have the great pleasure of introducing our speaker this afternoon, Adrian Miller. He is here to talk about his new book, Black Smoke, African Americans in the United States of Barbecue. Adrian is a food writer, culinary historian, and attorney who hails from Denver, Colorado. Now, some of you might be wondering how a Denver native became an expert on barbecue with traditions largely rooted in the South. Well, as a teenager, Miller's first full-time job was at a barbecue restaurant. He later began studying barbecue history and culture when he joined the Southern Foodways Alliance in 2002. It's an organization that documents the diverse food cultures of the changing American South. Two years later, he became a certified judge with the Kansas City Barbecue Society. He also serves on the American Royals Barbecue Hall of Fame nominating committee. In his travels as barbecue judge and in conducting research for his books, Miller has sampled some of the best Q the country has to offer, eating at more than 200 restaurants nationwide. I knew Miller had a great taste in barbecue when I read in his book that Gates is his favorite commercial sauce. It happens to be mine as well. I like the extra hot variety. Uh, Black Smoke is Miller's third book. He previously authored Soul Food, The Surprising Story of an American Cuisine, One Plate at a Time, which was a James Beard Award winner. And also The President's Kitchen Cabinet, a story of, the, of African Americans who have fed our first families from, from the Washingtons to the Obamas. You'll find more information about his work at adrianemiller.com. Adrian, thank you for being here. We are thrilled to have you. Welcome. Jeremy, thanks so much for that introduction. It's so good to be with you all. And thank you to the Kansas City Public Library uh, for giving me this opportunity. You know what? I really wish this was an in-person event because that would give me a reason to come to Kansas City and eat my way through your town, which I've done a couple of times. But, you know, we take things as they are. So I'm glad for this virtual opportunity. So what I'm going to do today is just kind of go through my writing journey, how I came to write this book, and then just give you a taste of how the book is organized, some of the stories that um, I tell in the book and highlight certain Kansas Cityans um, that, I, that I talk about as well. And then we'll take your questions. So without further ado, let's get to the PowerPoint. All right, so this is me and one of my favorite barbecue joints in Denver, Colorado, called Boney Smokehouse. Unfortunately, it closed, but you can tell how much I was impressed by the barbecue there. And it was uh, one of the last remaining African-American owned and run barbecue joints in Denver, Colorado. But it was a great place, and I miss it dearly. Uh, you were encouraged to do social media while uh, during this event, um, so I'm almost platforms. I'm Soul Food Scholar. So feel free to give brothers some love. Unless you have something negative to say, then you can just hold on to that, right? There's really no reason to share that. All right. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I have written two other books. My first book was Soul Food, The Surprising Story of an American Cuisine. And in that book, I uh, delved into the history of African American food traditions, and I created a representative soul food meal. And I wrote a chapter about every part of that meal. And I explained what it is, how it gets on the soul food plate, and what it means for the culture. And originally, I was going to have a, a chapter on barbecue because so many soul food restaurants have a barbecue option on the menu, even though hush hush, it's usually baked with barbecue sauce pulled, poured on it. But and then so many black owned barbecue joints have soul food side dishes. But um, as I delved more into the issue, I thought, you know what, barbecue needs its own treatment. Um, and then also my research for the soul food book led to the president's kitchen cabinet, which is a collective biography of African American presidential chefs. But let's get on to the main presentation. All right, I wanted to give you that Sunday kind of drive-in movie feel. Now, before I get into it, I want to thank a few people. First of all, Dave Wargel, who wrote a great book, The Grand Barbecue, which really informed a lot of my, my information on Kansas City barbecue. Uh, I said Dave, I'm sorry, Doug, uh, Wargill, Dave, sorry about that, Doug, I messed up. Uh, but Doug, thank you so much for um, writing such a great book. I also wanted to thank uh, Jill Silva, who uh, we went to the same high school, 
And um, man, it, 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 she just did a lot to help me uh, understand Kansas City's barbecue scene as well. And actually wrote a, one of the collective, kind of one of the biographies that I include in my book of the Jones sisters. So thank you, Jill. And then I also want to thank Artie Davis, known as Remus Powers, who uh, had also been a great guide to Kansas City barbecue. Um, in 2014, we went to Elsie's and here's the late Elsie Richardson. Um, that was one of my favorite places in Kansas City. So uh, Artie, I just want to thank you so much uh, for what you've done to uh, help me understand Kansas City barbecue as well. All right, so the question is like, how did I come to write this book? So I mentioned I was going to do some um, writing on barbecue for my soul food book, but then I thought I needed to do a separate treatment. So I was kind of milling about just trying to find out what I could about barbecue. And uh, I came across this show on the Food Network, uh, Paula Southern Barbecue, hosted by Paula Dean. And I thought, well, let me just check that out because that will give me a sense of you know, what a barbecue is like in the South in the 2000s, who are the important people to follow, that sort of thing. Uh, and I watched the show and about an hour later, as the credits are rolling, there were no African-Americans featured on the show. And so I thought, well, how does this happen? And the first thing I thought was, you know, maybe I got it wrong. Maybe it was Paula Deen's Scandinavian barbecue and I somehow got it twisted. I wasn't paying close attention. But as I started to look at other media, I found out that, you know, this was pretty much a similar problem across uh, film, TV, print, you name it. Uh, African-Americans were either completely left out of the barbecue story or they were considered bit players. And that didn't square with my experience. So uh, let's look at how it started when we talk about media coverage of barbecue. So we're gonna zoom in here. This is a, um, the cover for an issue of Harper's Weekly, November 9th, 1895, talking about something called the Atlanta Exposition, which had an exhibit they called the Georgia Barbecue. And at the Georgia Barbecue, um, you had basically an African-American labor force doing all of this stuff. So let's just zoom in here. And um, center stage, you've got two African-Americans who are doing what is called pit barbecue, traditional Southern barbecue. And that was essentially digging a trench, filling it with hardwood burning coals, and then you would cook whole animal carcasses. Now, a lot of the understanding of Southern barbecue is that it's all pork, but that's not necessarily what it was all the time. You could have goats, you could have lambs, you could have, uh, you know, cows. The cows were too big, so they'd have to be quartered. All kinds of things could be cooked over the pit. But the main thing is that in the 19th century, it was well understood that most, most barbecue was cooked by African-Americans. And uh, if you wanted the really good stuff, that's who you, you sought out to cook your barbecue. Now, aside from the men in the middle here, we're gonna go over to the right and you're gonna see an African-American man with a shovel. And in that shovel, you've got some um, basically hardwood burning coals. And so what often was the case is that a separate fire was maintained and so the cook would um, kind of survey the grounds and look at the pit. And if there were any cold spots, they would uh, replenish the coals from that separate fire. And then over that gentleman's shoulder, we have a, a group of white spectators beholding the whole scene because it was a spectacle. Um, the logistics, uh, how it all happened, the coordinated work and singing by the African-American cooks, um, it was all a sight to behold. Now let's uh, go over to the top, we see couple of men sitting on bales of hay. Uh, one is playing a harmonica. The reason why this is important is because even after the barbecue, uh, African-Americans were called upon to provide the entertainment. So that was likely what these two uh, gentlemen are going over. And at the very top, we see uh, someone with two big kettles. They're cooking what is called Brunswick stew, which is a traditional side dish with Georgia barbecue. And it's essentially, it's a descendant of a hunter's stew. Um, it started out with squirrel and a mix of vegetables. By the time we get to modern times, the squirrel has been substituted for chicken, but it's still a popular dish with um, Southern barbecue, to, uh, Georgia barbecue today. And then coming back down, we see a white gentleman in a top hat who's kind of pointing uh, things out and giving direction. Now, this typically was what was happening in the 1890s. By this time, more white men were in barbecue and often got credit for hosting and coordinating the barbecue. Now, we don't know how much skill they had, but typically they got all the credit for the barbecue, even though African-Americans were doing that work. 
All right, now let's speed up to the 21st century. This is a cover from Bon Appetit magazine. Um, not necessarily the, the magazine cover, it was the cover illustration for a lengthy article about who's who in American barbecue. So we're gonna zoom in here as well. Now, do you all remember the Where's Waldo photos from the 1990s? You know, one of the great things about that is that Waldo was actually in the illustration. So here we've got this backyard barbecue scene with all of the leading figures in barbecue. And there's very little diversity. We've got the Asian American man in the middle with the beach ball. Uh, we've got a woman kind of, if you scan over to the left. Other than that, it's pretty much all white dudes and no African-Americans to be seen. So the question is, how do we go from that Harper's Weekly cover to the Bon Appetit article? And that's really what I'm getting at with Black Smoke. So um, it's really a celebration of African-American barbecue culture and a restoration of African-Americans to the barbecue narrative in this country. I started out by looking at the Native American Foundation of barbecue, which was a surprise for me because when I was thinking about um, the early history of barbecue, it's pretty hazy. We get de de descriptions of Christopher Columbus and his crew seeing indigenous people in the Caribbean cooking meat in a certain way that they hadn't seen before. Um, but the way they were doing it in the Caribbean, as we'll get to in a moment, was different than the way it evolved in the American South. So I was wondering what accounted for the difference. So I went back and I looked at kind of diaries and journals and other descriptions from Europeans about what they encountered when they were going through the American South and watching um, indigenous people cook meat. The reason why I'm relying on European sources is because uh, Native Americans often relied on oral traditions. So we don't have much information pre-contact of what the meat cooking was like. And as flawed as it is, because we know that Europeans sometimes weren't great at describing what they saw, and other times they had an agenda, but in a literary, literary tradition, this is the evidence that we have. So one of the cooking styles was something called piercing sticks. And essentially you could either take morsels of meat and put it on kind of a platform that was stuck in the ground. Um, I shouldn't call it platforms. It's just basically sticks with a, a framework is a better way to describe it. And the mor morsels of meat were affixed to the framework and then you could push it towards the fire or push it back in order to regulate the cooking. Or sometimes you get a really long stick and put a morsel of meat at the very end of the stick and the weight of the meat would bend it towards the fire. And that was one way to cook it. Another way was to uh, create a, a rotating spit of sticks. And this would have been very, uh, very familiar to Europeans because that was often how they cooked meat um, back in Europe. Now, the big difference here is that uh, we're using wooden sticks instead of metal because Native Americans hadn't developed metallurgy by this point. The raised platform is pretty much what Christopher Columbus saw and his crew saw in the uh, Caribbean when they first encountered barbecue. So this is a raised platform made out of sticks and essentially meat, um, usually fish, iguanas, vegetables, and others were uh, placed on the platform and it was put over a very slow fire. And there's some reports that this cooking took more than one day. It could take multiple days in order to cook the food. But the idea here was not for immediate consumption, it was more for preservation. It was really smoking this meat and vegetables for uh, uh, future use. Another approach is an earth oven. And with an earth oven, what you do is you dig a vertical hole you put a mixture of wood and stones on the bottom, you set the wood on fire and it heats the stones and then you create layers of vegetation and meat. And then once you got to the surface level, you'd either cover that with something or just bury it. Now, depending on when you started the cooking, if you started it early in the day, you would have a feast by the end of the day, but typically people would do this kind of cooking overnight and then they would have a breakfast of champions. But the thing that kind of puts us on the road to barbecue is the shallow pit method. And what would this meant is, so it wasn't as deep as the earth oven and that vertical hole, but there would be a depression in the ground. And then again, a mixture of wood and stone set on fire. And sometimes the meat was laid right on the stones for cooking. Other times there was a lattice created with sticks and you would put the uh, meat on there and let that smoke it. And so essentially over time, European colonists and enslaved Africans through a trial and error process, get to what we call Southern barbecue, which is what we saw in that picture from Harper's Weekly. So um, at the end of chapters, I do a little, um, I tried to have vignettes 
of people from barbecue history who uh, really enforce the themes, reinforce the themes of the chapter. So in this chapter, I chose uh, Henry Papa Miller, who was in Doug Wargle's book, The Grand um, Barbecue. And thank, thank you, uh, Doug, for finding that because um, other, if you hadn't talked to his relative, one of his descendants, I think this uh, information would have been mostly lost to history. Uh, and the thing, the reason why I thought this was important is because we don't get a lot of depictions of African Americans and Native Americans cooking barbecue side by side, but there's a lot of inferences through interviews and other things of some kind of apprenticeship or some way that this culinary knowledge was passed on. And so Henry Popper Miller uh, talked about his great great grandfather who was uh, Native American and he was the one that essentially started barbecuing or, or passed the barbecuing art down through the family. So uh, it was great to tell his story and have this kind of figure who represented the, the transition from Native American cooks to African Americans when it came to being barbecues go to cooks. So here's another uh, example of this. By the time we get to the 19th century, barbecue and blackness are wedded. Um, so here's a newspaper article from 1839 for the Bangor Whip, and that's Bangor, Maine. And in this article, the writer is trying to introduce these, this main audience to the details of a Southern barbecue. At that time, it was called Virginia barbecue because Virginia is the birthplace where all of this stuff happened. And so, um, in order to get an authoritative source, he reached out to a friend who was a native Virginian, as the article says. But the key part of this article here is kind of in the third sentence there. It says, on the previous day, some favorite Negro man of reputation for skill and experience in the business is sent up with his assistants who proceed to make a kiln or pit of stones. And so what this is, article is telling you, and this is not an isolated example. There are a ton of articles like this in the 19th century. They're basically telling you that, hey, if you wanted to have an authentic barbecue experience, it's probably gonna be prepared by an African-American man. And during this time period, a high probability that that African-American cook was enslaved. And the reason why this is the case is because barbecue was very labor intensive. Somebody had to dig that pit. Somebody had to cut down the trees to get the wood. Somebody had to burn that wood. Somebody had to get you know, the stones if they were gonna be used. Uh, kill the animals, dress them, cook them, season them, serve them, and then also provide the entertainment. So a lot of barbecue during the 19th century was a black experience from start to finish in terms on, on the labor and cooking side. Um, also the reason why barbecue was preferred is because it's very scalable. As long as you have enough land and enough labor and enough food, you can put on barbecues for a ton of people. And we get reports of barbecues for 10,000, 25,000 people um, in the late 1700s and during the 1800s. And so barbecue becomes a part of civic culture. And again, because a lot of this was powered by uh, slave labor, uh, these things could be put on for very little cost because all you had to do was just essentially pay for the food and any other um, kind of necessities for the barbecue outside of labor. So essentially, African-Americans as enslaved people become barbecues go-to cooks. And then even after emancipation, African-Americans emerge with a very marketable and coveted skill. And essentially, they become barbecue uh, ambassadors. There are people all over the country who want a taste of authentic Southern barbecue, and they recruit African-Americans to come to their community and make this barbecue. And sometimes the African-Americans would stay there and uh, make that their new home um, because they didn't want to go back to the racist South. And um, they would often kickstart the community's barbecue scene, sometimes by starting restaurants, or they may come later. So there was uh, the last part of the, the, after the Civil War, the latter part of the uh, 19th century was a time when barbecue culture spread. And a lot of it was because of African-Americans. And prior to the Civil War, barbecue often spread because it was so tied to slavery. So wherever slavery went, Barbecue soon followed. So then after talking about the early history of barbecue, I get into kind of barbecue culture. So one of the first chapters I did was on church barbecue. And, um, you know, I have to tell you, barbecue has been very distracting to my spiritual life. Uh, you know, every time when I read the Bible I, and I saw the words burnt offerings, I would think about barbecue. And then questions arose like, you know, the scene of the burning bush did Moses smell hickory or oak? 
maybe mesquite, you know, things like that. So uh, we find that barbecue is a very important part of church culture. And really, in the by the time you get to the early 19th century, two leaders really figure out that barbecue is great for drawing a crowd and persuading people to do stuff you wanted them to do. The first were politicians, and then preachers were soon uh, not too far behind. And so um, a lot in the plantation culture, you find a lot of examples on the weekend when the work schedule would slow, Af African Americans would uh, have barbecue after some kind of religious service. And this was a way to reinforce social ties, build community, share information. Um, and then also when there were these big multi-day religious experiences called camp meetings or revivals, barbecue was often a featured uh, food at these events as well, because it was a great way to feed a crowd. And also um, during uh, slavery, barbecues were actually the planning times for some of the most um, provocative slave rebellions. They weren't ultimately successful, but some of the most provocative ones were planned over um, barbecue. So in this chapter, I talk about the connections between church and barbecue. So on the left-hand side, you see an ad from the 1920s in Montana uh, of a church barbecue uh, being in Montana in the West. This one features beef. You can tell that that's a cow carcass being cooked. And then on the right-hand side of the screen, um, well, I wrote a vignette about, his name was Daddy Bruce Randolph Sr. Daddy, quote unquote. Um, he was not an ordained, ordained minister at all, but he was a uh, person of faith who really took it seriously. And so uh, he comes to Denver from Pastoria, Arkansas in the 1960s. And soon after he arrives, he runs a barbecue joint. And after he gets established as an entrepreneur, he establishes this tradition of providing free barbecue, or sorry, not free meals every Thanksgiving uh, to the poor. And it was to the point that by the 1980s, he was feeding 10,000 people regularly. Uh, so a person who lived out his faith. Now I will say this, there seems to be some kind of correlation between people of faith and barbecuing, especially preachers. Now I don't know how that connection comes together, but there are a lot of black preachers who are out there doing barbecue as um, a, an additional vocation or as something to support their church. And then um, I talk about barbecue freelancers. So this is my term for all of the African-Americans who have this marketed coveted skill and they make money doing it um, in their community and traveling all across the country. And so uh, one example is Columbus B. Hill. Uh, this is another Colorado example, but this is a guy who shows up in Denver from West Tennessee in the late 1870s. By the early 1880s, he's doing barbecue for thousands of people. Um, and uh, he establishes a, a strong reputation for this. Uh, on July 4th, 1890, when the cornerstone uh, ceremony uh, occurred for the uh, state capitol building, uh, he did a barbecue for 25,000 people. Then in 1898, one of the wildest barbecues ever recorded, um, he was supposed to do a VIP barbecue for 5,000 people at something called the Stock Show. It's a big tradition here in Denver. Um, and uh, essentially the word got out and 30,000 people showed up for this barbecue for 5,000 people and there was a food riot. Um, the mayor of Denver and the governor of Colorado tried to mollify the crowd and they were shouted down and people threw food at them. So it was an ugly scene and, and Hill's reputation definitely took a hit but he was able to make a comeback. So uh, that's Columbus Hill. Then I talk about how these barbecue freelancers, instead of being uh, you know, on the move all the time, actually start creating businesses. And um, one a great example from Kansas City is Henry Perry. Um, I love telling his story because he, there are early interviews of him in the, in the 1900s or the early 1900s where he's just talking a lot of smack. And uh, he proclaims, proclaims himself the barbecue king, although other people were doing this as well. For those of you who know his history, you know he started out as a porter and then eventually he was selling barbecue in kind of urban spaces in Kansas City and then eventually opens up a place. And I, I love this ad from the 19 teens um, from his business because it shows you that uh, he often had a very eclectic menu. So in addition to the things we know about like beef, pork and mutton, you know, the groundhog, the raccoon, the possum, all of that stuff was on the menu. So Henry Perry was definitely one of the um, Kind of celebrated early barbecue entrepreneurs. I also tell the story of Ernestine Vanduval, courtesy of her niece, Angela Bates, who um, has done a lot to, to keep her legacy alive. 
So she's from a place called Nicodemus, Kansas. I don't know how many of you know about this place. It's in Western Kansas. It was one of the earliest all black communities. And um, Ms. Van Duval grew up there, but she left and moved to Pasadena, California, where she actually ran a soul food and a barbecue restaurant uh, and did some catering. Evidently, Walt Disney loved her food. Um, but later in life, she returns to Nicodemus and she runs uh, Ernestine's Barbecue. And uh, the place still exists to this day. It's really only a weekend only place when there are more tourists in the area. And again, her niece, Angela Bates, is the one who's doing the cooking with the recipes from Ernestine Vanderbal. Uh, so I, I just think it's a great legacy story uh, given all of the history associated with Nicodemus. And I also wanted to make sure that people knew that these entrepreneurs were not always welcome. In some places, their uh, barbecue had a reputation for being unsanitary. And if you listen or read the early depictions of some of these barbecue cooks in the, uh, you know, on the streets and other places, uh, you know, some people had a point there because uh, they were cooking out of uh, used bed springs. Those were used as grills and other kind of improvised grills. And so here's a editorial from the Chicago Defender, which was a very influential African-American newspaper, um, basically telling you these germ dealers imperil the health on the south side of Chicago. Then um, I did a chapter on the African-American barbecue aesthetic because I'm often asked, well, what's the difference between African-American barbecue and barbecue made by others? The short answer is African-American barbecue is better. But if you want more description than that, I started to you know, talk about the seasoning, the preparation, um, but one big distinction is the sauce. Um, there's a conventional wisdom emerging, emerging that barbecue should be unsauced. And I think a lot of African-Americans would say, says who? So on the left side of your screen, you've got the famous editorial cartoon that happened after um, Arthur Bryant died, uh, where Saint, he's at the pearly gates and St. Peter asks him if he brought the sauce. And then on the left side of your screen, this is one of the earliest barbecue sauce ads that we find in newspapers. And this is for Georgia barbecue sauce. And the reason why I like this um, is because it has an African-American centered here. And you can tell that this African-American cook is doing the old school barbecue. Um, and I have to tell you, I'm a little surprised that there was no figure like Aunt Jemima, Faustus, or Uncle Ben, who emerged with barbecue as a, you know, as a pitch person, um, given the strong connections between African Americans and barbecue. This sauce did not last too long. The, these ads maybe ran for like a year, and we don't really uh, find much more out about the barbecue sauce company. But I like the way that this actually treated this African American with some dignity and recognized him as a barbecue expert. Um, one of the vignettes that I wrote on the sauce is about R.J. B. Collins, who created, uh, from the Chicago area, created something called Mumbo Sauce. Uh, and I just love this picture of him because that's just one smooth brother. Don't you agree? Uh, and then I talked about com competition barbecue because one of the big questions right now is why don't you see more African Americans on the comp barbecue competition circuit? So um, you're probably familiar with Memphis in May. You know, you have the uh, American Royal. Um, but Memphis is May is one of the largest barbecue competitions in the world. And the earliest winner was Bessie, Bessie, Bessie Kathy, um, who won it in 1978. And she won it with a very minimal barbecue setup, as you can see. Um, I think over time, as barbecue contests have become more corporate, the entry fees, the amount of money you have to spend on equipment and all the other things, um, it's become less of an incentive for African Americans. And historically, if you have barbecue competitions where the entry fee is either really low or free, you, you see more African Americans competing. The other thing that I didn't expect as I talked to, especially African American barbecue proprietors around the country about why don't they compete more in these contests. And some of them were saying, well, why should I give my product away for free? And others were saying, well, you know, I have nothing to prove. So I really don't need to be in a contest. So in addition to the financial uh, factors, I think there are other things going on there. Uh, the story I told in this uh, part of the book was of Sylvie Curry, who's one of the most recognized figures on the barbecue circuit. She's called the Lady of Q. And actually, um, if you're a Netflix subscriber, uh, there's a show called American Barbecue Showdown. She makes an appearance on that show and I'm not gonna give it away. Um, she makes a deep run and I think if you watch that show, you'll be very, very impressed by the barbecue that she makes and, and as well as the other food. 
So let's uh, go quickly through uh, African American influenced regional styles because people often ask me, well, what, you know, where have we seen the African American kind of uh, handprint on barbecue? So certainly the Carolinas, and I'm just saying this broadly because there's so many different sub regional styles, but essentially in the Carolinas, you've got a whole hog tradition. You've also got pork shoulder, you've got different size uh, sauces. This is barbecue on the top there. That's barbecue from a place called Grady's in Dudley. North Carolina, um, old er uh, elderly black couples doing their thing. They're in their seventies, making superlative barbecue. So you've got some coleslaw there, you've got some chopped pork, um, and then also hush puppies. So that's a kind of a, a familiar plate there. And then I think there's something called deep South barbecue. So this is like Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi, where uh, pork shoulder, spare ribs, chicken, and then also just Southern slash soul food side dishes and desserts kind of ran out the meal. Um, and, uh, oh, I'm sorry, let me go back to Carolinas. Typically the sauce is gonna be vinegar based with red peppers in the East and in the West, you add a little tomato. And then in South Carolina, we've got multiple sauces, including a, a mustard type sauce, so a lot going on there. In the deep South, in terms of sauce, um, my experience has been, it tends to be a tomato based thin sauce that's sweet. It's almost like a glaze. Um, so I don't see a lot of thick sauces in the deep South that just, just my experience. Memphis is an urban tradition. This is a chopped pork sandwich from a place called Payne's Barbecue, which to me is the platonic form of chopped pork sandwiches. And the uh, distinctive thing about Payne's is they have a mustard slaw, um, which is really tangy and very sharp. And it's just a nice contrast to everything else going on there in Memphis. Um, Memphis, you also have a strong rib tradition uh, and a thick uh, and a sweet tomato based sauce. Chicago is known for chicken, rib tips, and hot link sausages. So, um, and cooked in a glass container, or which people call an aquarium smoker, a, a glass and metal kind of uh, cooking equipment that you really only see there. Uh, East Texas is a place that doesn't get much love as a barbecue style. In addition to the south side of Chicago, um, when people think Texas barbecue, they often gravitate to the center part of the state, but Texas has several barbecue traditions. The central part, is really a legacy of Central European uh, immigrants who brought their indirect smoking traditions there. Um, in the southern part of the state, you've got a Latino tradition that's more that earth oven tradition that I was talking about. So you get barbacoa, uh, cabrito, uh, cabeza. Uh, cabrito is goat, cabeza is cow's head. So those are the things that show up in Southern. But East Texas is a legacy of slavery. When slavery gets to Texas in the 1820s or so, um, soon afterwards, you've got stories about massive barbecues um, done by enslaved African Americans. Kansas City, uh, that's a plate from Gates Barbecue. I'm sure that's uh, familiar to a lot of you. You can see the, uh, I got the, what did I get? I got ham and ribs with some fries and some pork shoulder, pickles, all that kind of stuff. A lot of, a lot of good stuff going on there. Um, and when I think about just kind of what you see across regions when it comes to African American barbecue, it's going to be pork spare ribs, chopped pork. Um, those are the things you often see, chicken and hot link sausages. Those seem to be the common denominators across some variation of these things across uh, the different places where you see African Americans doing barbecue. Um, also, uh, just some specialties here, and these are tend to be hyper local. One is rib tips. We talked about that with Chicago. Although I would say that rib tips are becoming more national now because um, they're showing up every place. So maybe not, I can't say that's hyper local anymore. Um, also Monroe County pork steaks are taking the pork shoulder and while it's frozen, creating uh, thin sliced steaks that are essentially are thawed out. And then when you want to barbecue them, you smoke them. And then when, before getting served, they are often put on the grilled and charred and served with the spicy sauce. You see this in Kentucky and parts of Illinois uh, and even Missouri, but Monroe County specifically refers to Kentucky. Also bologna. Uh, bologna shows up in a lot of places, um, but essentially the tube of bologna is slit and then put on the smoker. And then when, when ready to serve, uh, something is sliced off, you know, usually half an inch. And then and again, it's put on the grill to give it some char and then served in a sandwich form with some sauce and slaw and white bread. Another glorious thing, this comes from uh, Memphis primarily, is barbecue spaghetti. So imagine spaghetti served with um, the noodles 
And then instead of marinara sauce, you have barbecue sauce and grilled meat. It's glorious. I know you might be skeptical. I'm telling you it's glorious. Uh, and then burnt ends. You all know this story, but I, I, when I do my presentations, I like to remind people that burnt ends are something that um, you know is traced to Arthur Bryant's restaurant in Kansas City. And um, the, the burnt ends that we see today in a lot of places are a, definitely a uh, different form than burnt ends took in the early days. Um, but please, please, those from Kansas City, you've got people from other parts of the country, mainly Texas, claiming your birthright. So you all need to be more vocal about uh, burnt ends coming from Kansas City, please. So the main thesis of my book, after I give all of this history, is that barbecue media has fallen deeply, madly, softly, however you want to describe it, in love with white dudes at barbecue. And there are kind of four archetypes. So going from left to right, we've got the competition guy, Tuffy Stone. And again, all of these people, you know, have got their bona fides in barbecue, but these are the ones that tend to get the most attention. So we got Tuffy Stone as the competition guy. We've got Myron Mixon, it represents the Bubba type, right? The working class rural guy, although he's a competition guy as well and a restaurateur. Then we've got Aaron Franklin, who's kind of the urban hipster, you know, interesting facial hair, glasses, sometimes tattoos or piercings. And then we've got the totes who smoke. So Bobby Flay is a good example of this as a fine dining chef who's in barbecue much more than they were, um, you know, 20 years ago. And why is this? And my argument is because of foodies, and I'm one of them. You know, we're the people that take pictures of our foods, uh, food. But in the late 80s, early 90s, there's this emerging group called foodies. And as this group is developing, essentially, um, they are getting more and more interested in authentic food experiences from around the country. And they're looking for people to curate their experiences. And so given that, there's a commensurate rise in media to cater to this group of foodies. So at the very time that foodies are getting interested in barbecue, they're asking two questions. What is barbecue and where do I get the good stuff? And the food media, uh, unfortunately, was not interested in diversity. And so often um, they were white dominated, talked to other white people, and essentially the people that were put forth as the curators, the experts, the go-to people in barbecue were white guy after white guy after white guy. So fast forward now, because of the shift from barbecue's focus in the way that it was done traditionally over a pit, and then even the ways that African-Americans did it in an urban context, we have this emerging conventional wisdom. First is that barbecue was cooked low and slow. And again, this is partly uh, part of the emergence of kind of indirect smoking techniques being considered barbecue. Um, but there are a lot of African-Americans who cook hot and fast. In fact, I remember seeing um, video of Ollie Gates or Ed Mitchell, who I'll talk about in a little bit, uh, talking about the very, this is the very way that they cook. There's also this narrative of barbecue means using lesser cuts of meat. Well, that's something that really doesn't emerge until the turn of the 20th century. And I'm borrowing from an argument by Robert Moss, who essentially argues, hey, look, um, when, the, when barbecue shifts from a rural to an urban context, that traditional whole animal cooking over a pit maybe doesn't make sense because of space constraints, health code regulations, you know, there's all kinds of reasons that could happen. So people started building pits and this made barbecue something you could have year round and several times during the day or during the week instead of just on the weekends. Um, and so people shifted to uh, focusing on lesser cuts of meat. Another reason why you could do that is anybody who's a cook knows that it's easier to cook a smaller cut of meat than a whole animal. Um, and so that becomes part of the conventional wisdom. Also no minimal seasoning, just salt and pepper. That's really kind of a chef sensibility, right? Um, and I know a lot of barbecue people using rubs, marinades, and all other kinds of things. But the one that irks me the most is this idea that barbecue shouldn't be sauced because you want to taste the meat. Um, and again, that does not square necessarily with an African-American aesthetic. So I end my book by talking about Af uh, Black Barbecue's future. Um, I spent some time talking about Rodney Scott, who is a barbecuer based in Charleston, South Carolina. Um, he's doing whole hog cooking in addition to other things. He started in Charles, started in Hemingway, South Carolina with his family, but eventually transitions to doing barbecue on his own. Um, so he has a place in not only Charleston, but also Birmingham, Alabama, and he just opened one up in Atlanta. He's got a great story. He's got some money behind him. And so it'll be interesting to see how much he expands his business. I also write about the Mitchells, uh, Ed Mitchell, legendary barbecuer out of Wilson, North Carolina, 
um, who also now is working with his son, Ryan, who came from the corporate finance world and has joined his father in the business. Uh, they do whole hog barbecue um, out of North Carolina. And this is the most traditional barbecue, as I've argued. Um, and they used to do be part of something called the Big Apple Barbecue Block Party in uh, New York City and kind of like 2010, uh, around that time frame. But um, that festival became so hu hugely successful that they no longer do it. They just could not meet the demand. And then I also wrote about the Jones sisters. Actually, Jill Silva contributed the essay for the Jones sisters, um, who uh, has, has such a star turn after appearing on uh, Queer Eye. And I'm so happy for them because they're such wonderful people. And uh, it was great to have them in the book. And also, I just think it's a stroke of genius to create a barbecue vending machine. I mean, how cool is that? So I just love that. Um, let's talk quickly about barbecue's current trends. <coughs> Excuse me. One of the biggest trends in barbecue right now is turkey. Um, so turkey has uh, been a substitute. Uh, so in East, in the Carolinas, you find it substituting for chopped pork. Uh, even whether it's shoulder or whole hog. And I'm telling you, except for a difference in color, you might not think that you are eating turkey. Um, and then in Memphis, it's pulled turkey instead of pulled pork. Um, in Chicago, South Side, you've got turkey tips instead of rib tips, things like that. But one of the interesting things um, from the other side of your state are turkey ribs. So this is from a place called the Gobble Stop Smokehouse. And so a turkey rib is essentially taking a shoulder blade from a turkey and then butchering in a way so that there's meat on the outside. So it kind of resembles a rib. And we're starting to see turkey ribs show up in more and more places. Another big trend is plant-based uh, barbecue. And so what you're finding is that for people seeking a healthier alternative, they're swapping out uh, the pork for other types, uh, for uh, other plants. And so jackfruit is one of the most popular uh, substitutions. And um, I tell you, I have witnessed this. If you know what you're doing or you find somebody who knows what they're doing, um, jackfruit can have the taste, texture, and appearance of chopped pork. And so you're seeing that as a substitute for pork. And uh, not everybody pulls that off. Let me, let me just tell you, not everybody pulls that off, but the ones that do, do make it seem like chopped pork. Another one, I know this is kind of gross, but it's just something we got to think about now is that the technologies here where we can have lab grown meat so, and 3D printed meat. And so the question is, uh, will consumers accept this? Um, if they do, it will have a lot of implications for our current food system and also for animal welfare, but it's just something to think about. You know, will, will brothers and sisters be grubbing on impossible ribs in the future? I don't know, but it's, I mean, the moment is now. Also, uh, just uh, if you hadn't heard, um, I am, on, you know, it, meant, it was mentioned earlier that I'm working with the American Royal Barbecue Hall of Fame on their nominations for their, for their Hall of Fame. And I'm happy to announce if you haven't heard that Arthur Bryan and Ollie Gates will be inducted uh, this fall. And so uh, we have a strong, strong uh, growing presence from Kansas City and the Barbecue Hall of Fame. So that's great too. So um, I'm going to end here by saying, you know, I was, I thought that I was going to write an elegy for African American barbecue, but actually I'm very excited. We may have fewer barbecue brick and mortar locations than we did several decades ago, but the African American barbecue scene has merely shifted. We still have a lot of people cooking at home, cooking in their churches, family reunions and public parks. We still have restaurants. We have more food trucks now, and we still have the, you know, the impromptu entrepreneurs, the, the barbecuers on the roadside or in the parking lots doing their thing. So uh, we just gotta maybe look a little bit harder for that barbecue, but it's still there and it's vital and it's an important part of the American barbecue story. So thank you for joining me. Black Smoke is now available. You know, Kansas City Public Library certainly has copies, uh, but if you wanna purchase it, you can find it at local booksellers and online and also from me. So thank you so much and I'll give it back to Jeremy. Thank you, Adrian. Uh, great stuff. I'm gonna have to seek out a turkey rib. I have not seen that on a menu yet. Is that more regional or are you just starting to see that in a, a few places around the country? Yeah, I'm starting to see it just in a few places. So it's certainly not widespread yet. It's, it's mainly a St. Louis thing. Um, and you see it at a lot of state fairs. That's a very popular thing, and including the, you know, the big turkey legs. Um, you, you see that as kind of state fair food. So it's starting to spread. Okay. 
uh, uh, our, I want to encourage our audience, if you have a question for Adrian, go ahead and submit it in the comments. Uh, Adrian Jill uh, Silva is uh, says hello and, and wanted to mention that her book club is reading Black Smoke currently and three quarters of the way through it and enjoying it immensely. All right, Craig, thank, well, thanks for joining us, Jill. And again, thanks for your contributions and being one of my guides. I have, uh, I have a couple questions. I've been jotting down some notes uh, from your presentation. Uh, you know, you, you mentioned that there's been fewer uh, African-Americans, uh, black, pit, black pit masters at competitions that they've become more corporate sponsored, larger, a huge expenditure of time and, and, and money. Um, do you think that has resulted in fewer barbecue restaurants owned by African-Americans? Since it seems like people who are successful in competition often go on to catering and in, in, in the restaurant business. You know, that's really interesting. Um, I think that we have fewer barbecue restaurants that are black owned for other reasons. I think it's a lot of that is just the lack of access to capital. Um, you know, and, the, and there's so many barriers for black entrepreneurs to actually own a business. And then once you have a business, it's so hard to just run a business itself. And so I think that that's playing into uh, a lot of this. And um, you know, it, for a lot of our uh, black entrepreneurs, um, the pandemic of course has affected everyone. And one thing that was of interest to me is that of the black barbecue restaurants that have closed that I know of, they pretty much are the ones that had a strong sit down business model. Um, a lot of black owned barbecue joints are takeout for a lot of reasons. And so I think in some ways they may have been pandemic ready, uh, but it'd be really interesting on the other side to just look back and see who weathered the storm. Um, it'll be interesting. Yeah, that will be interesting in the next few years to see who, as you said, weathered the storm. Um, I want to touch on a couple of things that I, I found interesting in your book. Um, one of them, you mentioned the popular, recent, fairly recent popularity of, of uh, beef brisket on the menu at, re at, at uh, restaurants and barbecue joints, and how that put pressure on black barbecuers and restaurateurs who didn't traditionally offer it as a as a menu item. Can, can you explain that in more detail? Yeah, so this is an insight from a, um, a radio interview of some African-American barbecuers. But essentially, you've got people walking into the restaurant because Central Texas barbecue, because they have the best cheerleaders, I'm just telling you. They're so proud of their culture and their food traditions, man. Central Texas barbecue is now the default barbecue style. I think two decades ago, we could have argued whether it was Kansas or Memphis, but that's no longer the case. The new restaurants and the people getting some spotlight and shine, they're from Central Texas. So you've got people believing that beef brisket is barbecue and they're walking into these African-American joints and if they don't see it on the menu they walk out and so as a, a restaurateur you have to make a decision right I have a changing I have changing tastes among my customers do I do I meet that or do I stay within my wheelhouse and say this is what we do if you want that kind of barbecue you know go elsewhere it's a tough choice I have to tell you um, it seems like quite a few people have decided to bend towards the current tastes and you know there's just a lot of mediocre barbecue beef, you know, beef brisket being made, because that's just not what they're used to making. Uh, you know, over time, maybe it'll get better. But, um, you know, it's easy for me to say, because I'm not running a restaurant, but I, I just love the places that say, this is what we do. And there's a whole wide world of barbecue. So maybe you want to try something different. Um, it's going to be good. Yeah, you know, with profit margins being tied, you, you can, I guess you can't blame uh, people for wanting to expand their menu to, you know, to what people, you know, the current trend in the industry. Um, another thing you mentioned in your book was that when you decided to become a, a certified uh, barbecue judge, that you were frequently the lone African American at these competitions, or at least I remember, I think that's what I re remember reading. Has, it, it, since that time, is there, uh, have you seen, have you seen an effort to recruit more black judges? Have you seen more uh, black judges at competitions in recent years? Of course, excluding last year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I haven't seen any focused attempts to recruit more judges. Um, and I have to say, it wasn't because it wasn't a welcoming environment. Um, I just think part of it is just, I don't know, for reasons people are just not interested in that. Um, so uh, in, in now, another function of this is that, you know, I was in Colorado. So there's not a lot of African Americans here also. So my perspective is in, but in watching TV shows when they were, you know, panning the judges room and everything like that from different parts of the country, I didn't see many African-Americans. One thing I wanted to, you know, uh, ask you about too, uh, 
this will be something of interest to a lot of our uh, audience. We have a lot of Kansas Cityans that uh, vacation in Colorado, the travel to Colorado. You mentioned uh, Boney's that is closed. That was the name of it, correct? Correct. Um, which is which is unfortunate. Are there any other uh, uh, barbecue restaurants in the Denver, Colorado area that we should be visiting when we when we travel west? Well, unfortunately, the the place that I was going to mention, I think they just closed because I went there uh, Friday and um, during lunch, and they should be open, and they weren't, and the phone was just you know busy. So um, I hate to put that out there, but the, there are Denver's barbecue scene has definitely stepped up. There's a place that says that they're um, Kansas City uh, in origin, it's called Burnt Ends Barbecue. It's in the Denver Tech Center. So you can get a taste of home there. Um, most of the places now that are thriving are tend to be like Texas style barbecue. Um, but black owned places, I would say some places to check out would be Hungry Wolf. Um, that's the place that I don't know, they may have just closed. Um, there's another place called Stew Boy, which is in very South Denver. And there's another place called Mississippi Boy <laughs> that just opened. Uh, and then there's a place called J Bo's and Winston Hills. So those are the black owned places that I know of. Um, but then other places that are really good is there's a place called Owl Bear, hoot, hoot, growl, growl, all, all one word. And um, the guy who runs that place actually worked at Franklin Barbecue for five years. And Franklin Barbecue is the, I mentioned Aaron Franklin earlier, it's the place where people stand in line for four hours. Uh, and there's another place called Roaming Buffalo Barbecue, which does lamb and bison which is more traditional kind of Colorado barbecue. So if you go to my website, soulfoodscholar.com, there's in the navigation bar, there's resto recommendations. A lot of these places are in my barbecue tab there. Okay, that's great. Uh, you know, I, I wanted to echo uh, your sentiments about, you know, wishing you could come to Kansas City for this program. You know, when I, when I first thought about this book talk, book talk, we we have a outside of our auditorium, we have a rooftop terrace and I had envisioned uh, smokers out there on the terrace and in a barbecue reception, maybe afterwards, you know, Sunday afternoon reception, oh, uh, you know, hopefully sometime soon we, we can we can get back to that. Um, what, but I'm curious, what, what has it been like um, writing, researching, writing, promoting a book uh, dur uh, during a pan time of pandemic? Yeah, it's been really interesting. So a lot of my events have been virtual, although I have done a few in recent weeks as things have kind of opened up. Um, and there's a lot scheduled in person in the fall as people are trying to figure it out. You know, given the way things are going, they may transition back to virtual. So it's been a challenge because, you know, typically I would be on the road quite a bit hawking this book. Um, but even in the virtual format, it's been very well received, getting a lot of love uh, for the book. So that's been very gratifying. Um, and so, you know, I just kind of roll with it as it comes to me. We have a, we have a, a couple of questions roll in. Um, is it, are you aware of anyone researching writing about Latin barbecue? I am, I do not know about that. I'm trying to think, um, no one comes to mind. The only one um, that I can think of is uh, Francis Malman. Uh, several years ago. He's in Argentina. He wrote a book called The Seven Fires. So that's the closest that I can think of, but I, I don't know someone doing it in, in a book. Um, there's some definitely some people doing it um, in kind of like articles. Um, and so one, uh, the New York Times, I mean, I, I, Tejal Rao, I think is the name, wrote recently in the New York Times about California barbecue. Um, in a publication that I uh, guest edited called Gravy, for the Southern Food Lightways Alliance, uh, Gustavo Ariano uh, wrote about Santa Maria barbecue, but gave a, a different perspective. So um, I just don't know anyone who's put it in a book form yet. We had another audience question that was uh, specific, specifically rate related to Kansas City barbecue. In your research, did you find it was more influenced by the history of slavery in the state or the stockyards? Um, centered here in the city? Yeah, I think the stronger influence actually was from the stockyards. Um, I did find some traces of reference or references to barbecues that happened uh, in Kansas and close to uh, Kansas City and also in Missouri around that time, but I didn't see kind of the iconic descriptions of barbecues like we saw in other parts of the South. So I'm thinking that it may be um, not necessarily people that were enslaved doing the cooking, but it may have been 
people who had got that experience in slavery, either teaching whites how to do that or making up the labor force, you know, free people. Because most of the things that I found were post-Civil War. Um, now, there may be earlier descriptions in the area, but I just haven't found those yet. And where were your, your, your you know, I'm in a, working in archives and uh, special collections, what, uh, what would you, uh, the sources, you know, where did you find the most amount of information? Because um, it's not a well-documented history necessarily. Yeah, so my wheelhouse was definitely historical newspapers. And so I subscribed to several databases. Um, also, the Library of Congress is uh, digitizing a lot of newspapers. And so, you know, you have to figure out how barbecue was talked about in that time because the, the ways it was spelled, referenced, change over time. The, and then if you're trying to figure out the African-American connections, that changes over time, right? Different words are used. And so you have to figure all that out. But once you do, it's just a matter of then just sitting there and reading the articles and just taking the time to do it. So I, I've read thousands of articles um, talking about barbecue, but yeah, those um, historical newspapers were the, the boon to my research. And you know, it makes a lot of sense because newspapers were about chronicling the daily life of a community. And so um, in the early depictions of barbecue, they're very, very succinct. You know, here's who hosted, this is the day it was, this is how many people were there. Maybe you get some of the animals cooked, but that's it. But as the 19th century progresses, I guess journalists got more foodie like, and they started actually telling us more about the description, painting a picture of the scene, actually talking to the barbecue cooks. Um, you know, sometimes it was couched in racism, but we, we start to get into the mind of the people and we get more complete descriptions over time. And then I would say the second um, greatest source uh, was just looking at the uh, oral histories of formerly enslaved people and just looking at how they described barbecue. Adrian, uh, this has been a, just an excellent presentation. I, I'll wrap it up with with one last question of, you know, you know, what's your ne next project? Or is there an area of, uh, you know, written on soul food and barbecue and, you know, uh, um, uh, our, our presidents and who's and who cooked food for our presidents? Is there a, another topic that in interests you that you want to want to explore or plan to explore? Yeah, so I'm thinking about um, three things. I'm not sure which one will emerge. Um, they're much more niche, I think, <laughs> than barbecue because this barbecue book just hit at the right moment. But um, I'm thinking about like a, a dinner guide to having difficult conversations. So, uh, you know, like just laying out a four part dinner series to engage in issues in a community and how you could do that through food. Um, I'm thinking about writing about the African Americans in early Colorado because we've had some next level people here. Um, and I, I don't think a lot of people know about them. Um, and then also just looking at a history of African-American street vendors um, uh, in different cities, um, because I have, they were the food trucks of the 1700s and 1800s, and I've got the sheet music and lyrics for their street cries. So, you know, we could replicate what it's like to wake up in late 1800s New Orleans with all these people trying to get you to buy the stuff that they're selling. Those definitely seem like worthwhile projects. I, I hope you'll come back and talk to our audience here in Kansas City about those and or one of those topics in another book and and hopefully it's in person uh, yeah and uh f finally is is a uh, where's the best place uh, I know you have a website adrianemiller.com is that uh, a good place yeah. for our audience to go uh, look look for your books yes absolutely yeah so but or soulfoodscholar.com whichever one's easier for you to remember soulfoodscholar.com, I tell people, yeah, and I have a shop navigation, and so you can check out my books. Um, I have a spice collection that I'm selling, all kinds of stuff, so there's lots of goodies. Okay. Well, Adrian, thank you so much, and uh, I'd like to thank our audience as well, and make sure to go to our website, kclibrary.org, to see uh, more uh, programs that are coming up in July and August. Thank you. Thank you.